Coming up on today's episode, NASA releases new images of the Dragon XL and unknown bacteria, four different unknown bacterias, have been found on the ISS. And full self-driving? More like fake self-driving. Burn. Let's get ludicrous. Hey there, and welcome to Our Ludicrous Future. This is the podcast where we talk about all the cool future stuff happening today. <laughs> That's going to make me talk really weird. <laughs> I'm uh, Joe Scott with the Answers of Joe YouTube channel. <laughs> Go, Tim. Wow. that I don't know how I can follow that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, my voice has gotten to this weird cadence, and I couldn't get out of it. It's me, Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut, and with us is Benjamin <laughs> Solens. Oh, I don't know where, where to go from here. I'm so lost. <laughs> <laughs> oh. We have a show for you. Like, well, what do you do after yeah. that? Anyways, all right, guys. Uh, hey, it's uh, Ben Solnes, the everyday astrophysicist, and uh, here we are, the show uh, with our beautiful. Look at all these wonderful people in Discord right now, guys. How are you all few. doing? Ooh. Yeah, hello everybody. We got lots of. I, I think I see some new people even too. So. Thank you, everybody. Mm. For yeah, and hanging I out. mean, they're actually helping. Like, like I think the title yeah. line was made up by somebody in Discord. So, wow. If you want to be mm. one yeah, of these cool people me. that get to help craft and curate this wonderful, what, you know, top podcast. What Joe says. I'm not saying what number <laughs> top, but it is one of the top podcasts in the world. <laughs> uh, a one of the number. top million podcasts, at least. One of the, <laughs> yeah. one of the top <laughs> podcasts with the word ludicrous in it, probably. <laughs> Maybe one of the top uh, if you ten wanna, for that. Yeah, we'll have to. Yeah. We'll, you know, the judges. We'll we'll get back to you on that. If you want to be one of the cool people though that get to uh, listen, watch live, help curate this show, uh, you can learn more. Sign up at olfpod.com slash patreon. We do appreciate it. It really helps. And uh, you know, we've got a lot of fun stuff coming here. I think this year is going to be hopefully a much better one than last year. I feel like last year we could have had all these big events, done all these great things like we had done. In the previous year, but everything got stifled, and obviously for for valid reasons. I'm not saying it's an excuse. I'm just saying there were good <laughs> reasons. But hopefully, we can we can come out of that this year and do more. So if you want to help support us, olfpod.com/patreon. And if you're uh, short on time, as we all are, we get it. Then uh, check out the uh, the description down below if you're on YouTube, or I assume it's in the show notes on the podcast. I don't know. Does it work that way on podcasts with like timestamps and stuff? I don't mm -hmm. know. What but is anyways, uh, if you're on YouTube, at least, you can check out the uh, the, the description there and jump to whatever story piqued your interest uh, to come here, other than to look at our three beautiful smiling faces. So with or that, guys... Or hear cool voices. I just yeah. like, really, oh, I hear a cool voice. I have, like, the nasaliest voice. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and before we go on, Tim, you're getting close to a million subscribers. Congrats, bud. You are getting there. Yeah. yeah. No Joe Scott. But um, it might be in the next, <laughs> it'll probably take still another month or two. It, it, it should happen by the summer though. So maybe like I can celebrate, you know, I, I'm, hopefully we'll be able to get jabbed soon for the vaccine, yeah. you know, start a new life at a million subscribers. You know, your whole life changes, obviously, once you get that thing, you know, totally different. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. Joe? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You, you hide your, your gold plaque just slightly off frame like Joe does. Like right and everything right changes. <laughs> yeah, won't won't be able to go in public anymore. I'll have to get a, a bodyguard. Yeah. You know, that's, I've got well, a whole security a, team around me now. And uh Well YouTube uh, my own gives personal, that to you, right? Yeah, Zoe yeah. They, they send my Jake. own personal uh pedicurist and uh <laughs> real uh relaxation therapist and it's uh Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's awesome. Well we'll see. I think there's you know, there's some big events, you know, we're we're coming up on uh, well, why don't we just kind of say what some things are? This let's let's go through. We're gonna do something a little different right now. This we're we're winging this. Welcome to winging it Thursday okay. with the okay. OLF team. Dun, 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 uh, I, I just want to share dun, dun, dun. real quick <laughs> some things that I'm looking forward to in the ludicrous future. Uh, the ones that I'm looking most forward to is literally in the ludicrous future, as in the next hour while we're recording. We're hopefully <laughs> going to see if SLS will be static firing or not. Uh, I normally would be live streaming this, but uh, we'll just be kind of paying attention and uh, and do that. But the the next one that I'm most excited about is obviously seeing more Starship stuff happen and the potential launch of the orbital rocket this year. I'm saying this year. Yeah. Elon, Elon's saying, um, you know, in typical Elon fashion, he's saying July uh, 
first flight in July, but next week. Yeah. yeah. He's like on so, Tuesday and you're like, wait, which Tuesday, which <laughs> <laughs> or, is that next Tuesday? Or is that just like a Tuesday in the future? You know, where, exactly. where, what's the, what's the scale of, of the map we're looking at here? Yeah. But yeah, those are, those are some things that I'm, you know, looking forward to down here for sure is, is like, there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, but there's no SN11 flight. SN11 has, has did a static fire yeah. um, on what was that Monday now? I've already lost track of time. Time and space <laughs> don't exist. Um, I believe it was Monday. They had a static fire. It was not successful. It was Tuesday, Trevor says. Um, but yeah, the static fire was not a successful static fire. So we are waiting for a successful static fire of SN11 before they do another um, Starship uh, flight. So... You know, currently it's looking like it, it is likely, very likely going to be sl slipping into next week, you know, Monday at the earliest, knowing how this stuff goes still. You know, I'm always a little bit pessimistic about these times, um, knowing that they have to do a static fire and then have to wait, you know, for weather and all the other things. I wouldn't be surprised if it happens next Wednesday, which would still be a quick turnaround time. That'd be three weeks between 10 and 11. So if it happens by Wednesday, that'd be pretty impressive. Yeah. And then they're not going to just scrap it and go with 15, right? 15 is still a ways away from being ready for this stuff. Um, so they will fly 11, of course, because it's on the pad and ready to go. Um, but 15 okay. is still the next one that we're waiting on at this moment. And it seems like it's it's a little further behind than some of the other ones. So maybe they actually had to do quite a, a significant amount of you know upgrades and tweaks because it seems like there's going to be there won't be a three week turnaround time. I don't think between 11 and 15. So this might be my mm -hmm. chance. Well, I should be getting my car back April 1st ish. So this might yeah. be my chance to actually go home <laughs> uh, for a little bit. That's, that's not a good date. Um, I, think, I think they're <laughs> fooling you. I get up there. They're like, yeah, yeah. Just kidding. You <laughs> believed us. <laughs> wow. Now yeah. your car is just back to normal state, right? They're not like, Oh, by the way, here's a brand new solid state battery or something. Well, it's not Tesla. It's just a body shop. It's a Tesla no. certified body shop. So I really don't think they're going to be doing any upgrades to the car. Yeah. I don't hope. Isn't I hope suck? I don't get it's it. Like, it's like got a body kit and it's like, Four inches lower. It's gonna have it's... a little red light up front that that goes back and forth, and it talks to you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that would be good. Yep, yep. So I really it's, wish, yeah, Tesla would open up those APIs and just make it customizable. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like they're missing out a little bit. Like when Until Apple turn you know, when off Apple... their brake lights <laughs> by accident. Well, whatever. Just, just, just like the ability to do f more fun things be with the software. You know, like there are APIs, mm -hmm. obviously, and like, you know, we have apps like the one the one I, I work with and stuff, but it, but like it just be neat to be able to put your own apps and stuff on the car. You know, think about the iPhone before there was the app store, it, you know, there were, it did like five things and everyone was like, this is amazing. And then you got the app store and you were just like, yeah. what, what yeah. is this? And now the app store is like a huge percent of their revenue. I mean, I know I, I got to personally ask Elon this question. He basically was like, yeah, no. I was he was like, nah, not gonna do it. Yeah. And and then like more and more people have continued to ask him that question. It does sound like he's softening a bit to that idea, but I, I don't just know. Can't yeah, imagine like that maybe, they wouldn't do that. I know. Like just maybe I revenue. do want to put a red well, light even, in front and program it. I don't know. Why well, not? Especially with the new S and X and stuff with the you know, even more entertainment focused and things, you'd think it'd be a no brainer. Yeah. Like yeah. I really like Pandora Radio, but I am forced to use Spotify and I don't don't dislike Spotify. It's fine. But I there are some things on Pandora that I just really like mm -hmm. more. And so why not open it up to let, let's say to, uh, you know, certified partners, not to, you know, hacks like me or anyone else, but like Pandora, like a legit company, like, a you know, and obviously they've done this with Netflix and Twitch and all the mm -hmm. apps you see, like those are developed by those companies in kind of behind closed doors like in collaboration with them but just put out the spec put out the api let, let us do it man let us make the you know night rider ui or something <laughs> you know why not that'd be fun yeah that would yeah. be ludicrous well you know I, I, again so, i just uh, don't see them not doing it eventually because there's just so much revenue opportunity in that yeah think about it every yeah purchase or thing that could happen through it. I mean, I still dream of a day where 
uh, you know, if full self-driving ever happens in my lifetime, uh, I get in the car, it knows me so well. It's like, hey, you look a little tired. I'm just going to go ahead and order you a Starbucks and take you through the drive through right? <laughs> like, I, I know where you're headed. It's on your calendar. I know which Starbucks you go to because you have the Starbucks app on your car. Uh, and I'm just going to go just just take care of it all. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll just we'll just get you set up for the day. Like, I, that's a totally real future we could have. Or just know? to be able but to pay. But it would require. Yeah. If, if you could just pay from your car at any drive through. Oh, like pull cool. up a yeah. Wendy's app or a Starbucks app, like you just said, like you just when you get up there. Instead of having yeah, to get your out your wallet just and everything, you just it. press a button. Yeah. yeah. Really yeah I mean, or just automatically. Just having, yeah, like yeah. Apple Pay or whatever too, you know, or Google Pay or whatever, like just be able to do it on your dashboard and it Tesla close pay. enough to their system or whatever. Tesla Pay. You could have Tesla crap. Pay. What? Oh, Dude. think about for like for Seriously? tolls. I mean, and, everything and they already too, have you know. your, your credit card for supercharging. So it's already there. I mean, and obviously Elon, Dang. you know, was one of the guys at uh, PayPal. So, I mean, why not? You know, how about Tesla coin? How about forget that? Like you could have, <laughs> like you could, yeah. they could take, they, the car could turn into a much bigger platform, I guess, is mm-hmm. what I'm saying. You know what I mean? And I feel like they've been really resistant to that. And I don't understand why. Like I, the only answer when I, when I did get a chance to ask Elon that on that one call was he just said basically like you need tens of millions of users for it to be uh, profitable essentially because there is some work that they have to do. Mm -hmm. They have to maintain the APIs. They have to like have monitoring of it. They have to police it to an extent so people aren't doing exploits and things and whatever. I mean, it is your car. Although the media, you know, this part of it is like separate from the, the driving part. And if anyone that's had a Tesla long enough knows, you'll just be driving and the whole thing goes blank but you can still drive. Right. So, you know, like like it's still safe, but yeah, definitely it's probably a bit more intrusive than just like my phone or something, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, speaking of, you know, Tesla's full self-driving and driving you, and Tesla and stuff. What, there's you want to go drama. there? I'm okay. hearing a lot about this. I I want to hear about this. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't like just talking drama city, but what is actually going on? Can you give us the actual rundown? Okay. So there were a bunch of articles that came out and, and, and I don't know where I fall in this camp. You know, some people will put me on the really hardcore hater of this stuff, but, but really I'm like optimistic and hopeful, but also kind of trying to be realistic. So I'm, I'm kind of in the middle, I would say, because there are some people that are like, Tesla's already full self-driving. It's the best thing ever. I just sleep in my car. And then there's other people that are like, no, this is total, this is such a scam. You know, they're just, they're just lying to you, whatever. So somewhere in here is the truth. Uh, but recently, and, uh, Tim, you're supposed to be pulling up my link there. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> Let me do my job. Uh, recently there was a letter that Tesla sent to the California Department of Motor Vehicles, the guys who regulate, uh, you know, cars here out in, in uh, crazy California way. Um, and they state that full self-driving or FSD is not, uh, uh, autonomous. It is, it is not like so there's sae which has these definitions yeah there you go on the screen these definitions of uh levels of autonomy right so like there's level zero through five uh zero is like every car on the road right it basically has nothing or has very minimal things like a a blind spot warning or something um then you get more more into like oh it can actually like veer back in your lane if you're like drifting off the lane or it can have automatic emergency braking you're like level one then and then level two is where basically tesla like like normal autopilot is right it can like keep you in your lane and it can speed up and slow down so it it is like driving quote unquote doing air quotes for people listening here that it is essentially driving in a very limited, very narrow capacity where you, the driver, are still fully responsible for everything and need to pay attention. That's basically where autopilot is. Now, Elon and Tesla have, I don't know, for years now, I think 2017, he said that he, they would have a car that could drive from LA to New York without human intervention at all. Uh, but I think, I think it was, someone correct me in Discord if that was 2017 or 2018, but it was like, you know, years ago at this point, like ancient history. Uh, and that never happened. And people were asking why and, you know, lots of questions. But 
but then you get into level three, four, and five, you get into the, the real like autonomy stages. Now, level three, four, and five are where the car literally can drive itself without human intervention. Now, level three is where you still may be required, but you shouldn't need to be required. Um, then you get into level four. Level four is where it can drive itself and you can actually remove things like uh, like steering wheels at this point. Um, but it but it won't be entirely autonomous like like I still, you know, I, I, to me, I'm like, I don't know if this will ever happen, but like drop the car off in the middle of the desert and have it find its mm-hmm. way home without internet, you know, things like that. This is sort so, of like it's, it's geofenced in a way. Right. So level four is like, it, it seems like, you, it like has you, conditions it has to meet. Like it, if it doesn't meet all right. the local conditions, it, it won't even try to drive. It needs to fulfill all those conditions. And level five, it seems right. like it'll solve it no matter what. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So level four is still driver. That's autonomous driving. That That is, it's going to work, you know, assuming like it's within the bounds of geofence, but that geofence could be like Dallas, you know, it could be like a massive area or something. Um, and, and, but, you know, maybe if it's like snowing or certain conditions like that, it'd be like, hey, I can't, you know, I'm out, mm-hmm. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> Something like that. Uh, or like you're drunk and think you're going to throw up in here. I'm not going to just get out, you know, but <laughs> there could be a level four. You're talking no steering wheel in the car. There's no longer human. Uh, you, you know, you can remove those things. Level five is there's absolutely none. So level five is like it just always works. It there There's literally nothing you can do as a human other than maybe like punch in your destination or just tell it your destination you know you can have some input but you, there's no steering wheel there's no pedals there's no none of that this is like Westworld style you know you push a button the car shows up you get in and it takes you where you need to go kind of a thing and you get out so te- so my my I would venture a guess that a lot of people that have purchased full self-driving uh the software package from Tesla so so just just you know, and my buddy Ricky at Two Bit Da Vinci did a good video on this just today, I think. But uh, the the term "full self driving" by Tesla is a marketing term that they are using. It is not like a definition of that 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 clearly says, "Oh, it means level four or level three or whatever." Right? It, it's it's really not. So we have to try to like get our heads around full self driving. Although those words may sound to you like a certain thing, it's really a marketing term. Mm-hmm. Kind of like when people say data science. Like in the in the data world, data science means a very specific thing. But generally speaking, if you work in Excel, you're a data scientist. And that's not at all the reality, right? Mm-hmm. So so we have to kind of keep that in mind. Now, in this letter to the DMV out here, they're saying that FSD, full self-driving, will only ever achieve level two automation. Which is essentially where it is already. So when people are out there doing FSD beta testing, which they just recently announced, uh, I don't know if there's like a button or something, like anybody in the world. Like, I think it's the uh, the next version of the software update. Uh, I want to say like 802.3 or something, but it's coming out and apparently like anyone that wants to do full self-driving, again, quotes around what that means that's the marketing term from tesla they'll be able to do it and try it and that is where the car attempts to drive literally everywhere by itself now you still have to monitor it you're still responsible but the car is trying to drive through neighborhood streets without markings everywhere Um, so that sounds like level three uh yes but the letter is saying it'll only be level two wow so the letter I think that Tesla they... sent to California is saying yep. it'll only be level two. Correct. And 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 they hmm. do say that they're going to try to improve it over time, um, and that they will deploy autonomous features in the future. But what we're call, what they're calling right now as FSD beta, the things that you see videos <clears throat> of people testing out there, they're saying is only level two. Here's here's my my thought as to why, because because clearly it's it's functionally up appearing to be level three, right? It's trying to drive in all conditions on its own and you just have to kind of monitor it, whatever. Uh, and, and so depending on your situation, like I don't, I've seen some videos where I'm like, wow, that's impressive. And I've seen other videos where I'm like, oh my God, I am never trying that, right? So you kind of see both, both extremes. But my guess is that the reason they're saying it'll only be level two is because I think level three is where the the liability switches to them mm-hmm. versus yeah. you, 
So yep. if it's self-driving and I just have to, you know, barely occasionally possibly take control at the last second and this thing runs me into a wall or, you know, God forbid, like, like runs somebody over or something, uh, they're responsible. It's not my job. Like I am no longer liable. I'm the backup system. I am not the primary, primary. Res- party responsible for it. So that's my guess. I don't know. I mean, Tim, have you, well, you don't have your car right now. Um, mm. I, but I know you're probably pretty in tune with this stuff. I mean, I've just been paying, I haven't had a ton of time to, to pay close attention to this whole drama unfolding, but it does seem to me like, um, yeah, like it's kind of a bit of a mess right now, but it does seem to me like they're sandbagging it for liability purposes for sure. Especially with the beta, like specifically with the beta. Hey, this is a beta. It's only level two though. You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. But, yeah, that's what yeah. I was thinking when you were when you were saying that it's like some kind of regulatory jujitsu to like, I was thinking regulatory, but liability is probably the better better term to use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and and I kind of wonder though, do they actually get to decide this, or <laughs> will the DMV say, "No, nah, dog, I don't think so." <laughs> Look at this thing, and and the way they're talking, like like I that's the weird part to me is I don't fully like I completely understand why they would want to say this. But on the other hand, look at Elon's Twitter for the past four years. Look at their public statements about these cars. I mean, mm-hmm. I don't think they could argue that they haven't painted a picture of it being level five or four or whatever, right? Yeah. I, I, I yeah. think yeah. It, it, like like if it came down to it. Now, now, they actually did get sued previously for people that are maybe newer to Tesla and don't know about this. Uh, I think it was 2018 ish. Someone can look that up and and verify. But in 2017 is when they started releasing cars with what they called full self-driving. And, and it was, it was maybe a year or so later that a group of owners that had bought this full self-driving package got together, did a class action lawsuit and, and won essentially. So Tesla settled the lawsuit and paid them all out some amount of money. I think the total dollar amount was like $5 million or something. So, if now they're actually going back on this and they've been hiking the price up and charging people upwards of $10,000 for it, I, I I could, I think they're in somewhat hot water. Like, like if people could have, I could see a very legitimate claim going to court saying, look, this is what they sold me. It, 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 they painted this picture of what it can do. This is false advertising. Like, like you have to give me a refund. I could totally, I could see that being a very reasonable argument, hmm. you know? Um, mm-hmm. especially since now they're saying, oh, it won't ever do that thing that we kind of painted the picture of what it should Definitely. do. So I don't know. Like, it seems a bit of a an interesting, and I, I'm not full, I don't fully understand why they would say that uh, when everything else they do publicly kind of doesn't say that, <laughs> you know? Yeah. They've kind of painted themselves into a corner. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, you know, speaking of things driving around, on their own autonomously let's see it or how about let's hear it because nasa released some sounds of perseverance <laughs> driving around on the surface of mars and these are it's really cool so notice it's going to sound really it almost sounds like what we associate with like an underwater camera you know like when you hear like a gopro or mm-hmm. something and so a lot of the times underwater cameras you're kind of hearing uh you know something from inside the enclosure Uh, Don't forget, a lot of the sound on Mars would carry through the vehicle. You know, the the sound's going to travel through the vehicle or through the material. So it'll have a very similar sound to that, but it's still extremely fascinating. So here's, um, so they released basically 90 seconds. Listen to this. Can anybody hear that? You'll have to dub it Sorry, in. Sorry, if you, yeah, if you guys can't hear oh. that, we're gonna we'll be dubbing that in. Good luck, Ben. But basically, well, it's, that was it's, amazing. <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> it sounds squeaky and um, <laughs> and rovery, and it's Mars, so it's awesome. You guys definitely have to check this out. Um, but yeah, the yeah the audio is quite different, likely because of the thin atmosphere, and I'm guessing that the the cameras are still mounted or the microphones, the, the you know because of they're mounted again on on hard surface i'm guessing a lot of the sounds just simply traveling through like the bearings of the wheels and through the you know you're hearing through that medium and not so much through the air but mm-hmm. it's very very cool 
Yeah. I need to check that out. I, I had not seen this, but I, you know, just did a video recently about sounds on other planets and stuff. And uh, I was really psyched about the recordings from Mars we were going to get. Yeah. It's, it's cool that we're actually seeing, you know, well, hearing that <laughs> like finally come out now. And it's, uh, I don't know. It's, it's, it makes me wonder why they didn't do it before. It seems like a simple instrument, a cheap, you know, it doesn't have to be high quality. Just put something on there just for the fun of it like this, you know, just even for videos later on, like having sound of it is really cool. Yeah. I, I have to assume that there's something about the low atmospheric pressure that, that maybe makes it more challenging or too challenging for them to really focus on in the past or something. But, um, but I'm with you. It's like, it seems like it would be a very simple thing. And the fact that they haven't done it more makes me think, okay, it must be more complicated than I know about, you know, there must be some limitation. Yeah. That, that made it not feasible or worth it or something. Yeah. yeah. Or save yeah, or weight. Casper Stanley or just not even necessary. Yeah. But I don't know. I, I still, I, I still like this a lot. And I really hope that at some point we synchronize it with some video you know, they, that they upload a video and, and synchronize the, the audio to it just so we can actually have mm -hmm. legitimate, I don't know. So it's not like so many times you see these renders or CGI things about the, you know, the mission, you'll see like, <laughs> it's like this like hilariously perfect <laughs> yeah. sound, you know, it's like, I want to hear it just squeaky and weird and all the little pops and, and bangs and stuff. But um, yeah, or yeah, as, as Discord is talking about, uh, when they start using the drill, that'll be really cool. I want to see if yeah. they can hear ingenuity take off. Oh, it'll probably be too far away. I imagine they're not going to be anywhere near it when it, when it does its thing. That's the right. helicopter. That's kind of cool. Right. Yeah. And the actually we had some news about that. Um, so they actually yes. did basically prove or, or confirm where they want to be taking off from. So they're going to be doing a little um, on March 23rd. They're going to show us, um, discussing this, the next steps for ingenuity on March 23rd at 10 30 uh, Pacific. So one 30 Eastern. Um, so yeah, that's in a couple days. So that'll be next week. We should get some more details. Um, but this is what the, the NASA JPL had tweeted the other day it said teams for NASA perseverance and ingenuity have chosen a flight zone where the Mars helicopter will attempt the first ever powered flight on another planet. So that's great news that they kind of know, you know, they must've through images uh, from Perseverance, you know, chosen a nice spot. It looks it looks nice and, uh, you know, must be flat enough. And they're not too worried about, you know, rocks or running into cliffs or anything like that, obviously. So mm -hmm. um, that's fantastic news. Yeah. <laughs> this, it does have a camera on it, right? It does Ingenuity? have a camera on it. Yep. I think it that's has a pair of cameras, if I remember right. One, one kind of to navigate and one. Um, oh, yeah, man, if they could get a video from that, that'd be so dope. Be so from cool. Both. Yeah. I want to see like I want to see Perseverance recording the flight. Yeah. And then yeah. Ingenuity recording looking at Perseverance. So you just get this the sense of scale and the sense of of you know perspective that you just simply don't get normally. So cool. So so cool. They need they yeah, need so some that, uh 12K black magic cameras out there or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can loan them one now. Yeah. Well, maybe uh, maybe they could uh, maybe they could do it through a bowling alley on Mars. Have you seen that video? Oh man, yeah, the FPV drone oh, video. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. my god, that was amazing. I, can I find it. yeah, I am shocked. I've been, I've been seeing at how fast. So I don't know what that was on, but did, I don't know if you guys saw MKBHD's video about the the DJI, the DJI uh, FPV. FPV Dude, it goes. Yep. What what was the top speed in manual mode? Like eighty seven or eighty eight miles per hour yeah, or like something? Almost ninety something, mile an hour. Yeah. Something insane. I don't even know how that thing yeah. goes that fast. It's <laughs> oh, this looks terrible on Zoom. Well, and the way they time this up with the guy rolling the bowling ball and then swinging around to that other one. Yeah. Yeah. Joe's uh, sharing this. It's insane. It, if you haven't seen it, it's one of the coolest. This is one of It actually goes up underneath this thing. Like, look how tight that is. Yeah, I know. Yeah, there's some, some really talented. Yeah. Insane. I saw one Gosh. that was like this, but with golf, and they had guys, guys like legs. teeing off, and and they had the camera following the ball through the air. It was insane, and and they actually had like a <laughs> Canon EOS something on there. Trying to get it. So yeah. nuts. This is unreal. I love that though. Yeah, that's so cool. <laughs> the couple having a um, fight. 
Yeah, I love well, it. Well, they it had to really make it cool. real. <laughs> yeah, there, wasn't there another one at? Was it at Dallas Maverick Stadium? Uh, there was another one in a basketball stadium too, wasn't there? Uh, I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, I just <laughs> it's just amazing the types of uh, footage and things. Well, we I'm gonna go hang out this so. bowling alley now. They got a I know, movie theater. Is super and... cool. If I remember it, it's Minneapolis. It's super. Cool. Oh well, then I don't want to go. <laughs> I'm out. I want to go north. <laughs> and <Yeah. laughs> hate mail from Minneapolis. <laughs> I love ah. Minneapolis. So you can you can send um, Joe your hate mail and welcome and invite me up to Minneapolis, one of my favorite cities. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, if we're if we're going to talk about things in space, I've got something in space that I could talk about. Yes, I love this new order of just randomness. This is the new our ludicrous future. New order is a great thing. Yeah. The, it's the nudicrous future. Wait. Mm. Mm. No, that's wrong. Mm. <laughs> Ladies. Okay, so um, on Monday, I released a oh, video yes. about five space mysteries that scientists don't fully understand and blah, blah, blah. Well, one of them was <laughs> Oumuamua, which I misspelled throughout and even on the thumbnail because that's how uh, I roll. But um, of course... <laughs> Because I did a video on Monday and talked about how nobody understands what's happening with Oumuamua, a new paper was reported on Tuesday with a new theory <laughs> about what it could be. Like explaining Ooh. it pretty darn well, too. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so it's Hashtag basically they're explaining aliens. it's... <laughs> well, so we know it's from <laughs> outside our solar system. Um, yeah, yeah. And there's like in my video, I talked about how they were saying it may be like a hydrogen iceberg... Um, that was formed in a, in, a, in, a, in a massive cloud somewhere along the way. Um, but it here apparently is the Millennium that far Falcon. Of a journey, right? It wouldn't make that far of a journey if it was hydrogen. I think you said right. Right. Yeah. The idea being that, um, yeah, it would have if, if it was outgassing at the level that they saw that caused it to go, you know, speed up as it got, uh, uh, you know, on the other side of the sun. Yeah, it would have burned off a long time ago. Um, yep. But this one is saying that it's possibly a piece of a Pluto-like planet from another solar system. Um, and maybe instead of being frozen hydrogen, it's frozen nitrogen. Mm. And I guess, mm -hmm. people correct me if I'm wrong, but I guess there's like frozen nitrogen on the surface of Pluto. So this is basically saying like a piece of that flaked off of some other planet in another solar system and somehow got catapulted out and headed our direction. Um, so this is, um, who, who did this? Two Arizona State astrophysicists, uh, Stephen Detch and Alan Jackson, who is also a country singer apparently, um, of the School of Earth <laughs> and Space Exploration. They're the ones who came up with this. They published it in the Journal of Geophysical Research, colon, planets. Um, <laughs> But they, they did this little uh, interview here with a guy and he, he had a good way of explaining it. He was to, because, you know, it's so flat. That's like the whole thing about it. It's like this flat disc. The and shape so didn't make sense. Yeah, the yeah. shape doesn't make sense. And that's why, you know, a lot of people on the Avi Loeb is exactly the... Exactly like Earth. So they're just so confused. How did, <laughs> <laughs> How did that happen? See, that's proof. Um, <laughs> anyway, the way he explained that this could happen is because... It's being constantly bombarded in interstellar space by um, microwave background radiation and cosmic rays and stuff. And that just kind of like shaves little tiny pieces off of it as it goes along. And he explained it kind of like a, uh, yeah, here we go. So erosion by galactic cosmic rays. And then it just gets flatter and flatter. He explained it the way um, a bar of soap you know, like you, you take a bar of soap, no matter what shape it is, the more you use it over time, it becomes flatter and flatter and flatter because that just sort of erodes off of it. That's sort of just a natural phenomenon, I guess. And that's yeah. what they're saying happened here. It's basically, it's basically a bar of soap made out of solid <laughs> nitrogen. Nitrogen. From Pluto. From Pluto <laughs> that was used Pluto to shower B. with cosmic rays for millions <laughs> of years. Yeah. <laughs> And one of the things too is the the one of the mysteries that we're trying to solve is how it was accelerating or changing its velocity like it was because mm -hmm. you know comets do that by outgassing. There wasn't as much visible outgassing um, as you know as there wasn't really visible outgassing basically. And one right. of the things they figured out was the giant turd might the <laughs> albedo of it, how how bright it is. Sorry, I'm just seeing that video. It just looks yeah. like a giant turd, space turd. Mm -hmm. um, the the brightness of it would would account for a decent amount of that. 
Um, so because it's so bright, it has a little bit of solar pressure um, or solar radiation, one of the two, whatever, and it reflects and can actually, just like a solar sail or a solar, mm -hmm. I don't know, you know yeah. those, those little light bulb things, you ever seen these little light bulb things that have like black and white in, in the inside that just kind of spin freely? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, like that where the, the white part actually something, I don't know, something space, space things and astrophysics, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the, that, the that apparently that's all. here. The interesting thing here. Well, so did they say which solar system it came from? Uh, no, I don't believe so. Okay, but let me look through here. Yeah, yeah, that was. I read the article earlier. That was one piece I I didn't find there. Um, yeah, interesting. So, and and this is. I mean, they they're the way I, that reads is they're saying they solved it right, like they know for sure. <laughs> I, I mean, I think that's um, literally what he says. Like, we've resolved this mystery, right? But there's like 40 other people that think they've revolved, resolved the mystery and have published <laughs> papers on it, you know? Uh, this is just happens to be a one that has, like, all the math works out, right? All the, th all the problems, the things of like, well, how come this? How come this? Like, this one, all of those things worked is maybe what he's trying to say, right? Yeah, yeah. So, like, this could be, this is a viable answer. Um, you know, aliens is also a viable answer at this point because we know nothing about them. But, but in all seriousness, how the thing that that surprised me is how how like blind we still are to the universe. Like, I think maybe it's just me. I'm, I'm, maybe because I'm American, I don't know. But I feel like we have this sense of we know what the hell is going on in the universe, <laughs> but. This thing has been coming our way for since before humans existed, right? Yeah. This thing's been headed straight for us for millions and millions of years, and we just barely caught it on its way out. Like, wait a minute, what the hell was that? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and and we've since discovered uh, another one. Mm -hmm. Um, although that one was a comet, like clearly a comet, right. but it was an interstellar object passing through our our solar system. Um, and and I think it, it, am I correct? I, I think it was in the paper there. Like the reason we know it's not from our solar system is because all the planets and and uh, you know celestial objects in our solar system operate on like a very similar orbital plane because we're all like essentially sucked into it from the Earth or from the Sun, right? Like the Sun forces us all to be in a similar uh, I don't know what you call it, Tim, like orbital plane or trajectory. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yep. There, there there's um, a physical. Explanation for that 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 it's it's be, yeah. it's beyond my ability to explain or even understand really. But like the, there's something about the way gravity works and the the the, the right. rotational velocity of like the the spinning system and like a proto planet system uh, when they're still forming the planets that just causes it just causes the the disk to sort of flatten over time. Right. And then right. they you know yeah mm -hmm. it becomes planets and orbits and stuff. Yeah yeah, yeah so, conservation of angular momentum. Andy, thank you. Yeah. So, oh, you want to so use big and, words. <laughs> not to mention ahead, that Tim. we knew how that it was interstellar, not just because of the inclination, but also because of the velocity. So it was going, right. you know, you can yeah. measure the velocity and by knowing where an object is and how fast it is, you can tell where it came from and where it's going. So Yeah, um, and yeah, it didn't to... match with anything else in our solar system. So we're like, oh, it must must not be from here. But how how fascinating. I'm just blown away that like we had no idea. <laughs> like yeah. we we never even tried to look for this before. How was this the first one? I feel like we've oh, been looking I, at the stars well, as people I for think, a long time. Well you know, it just it just you at the illuminates or watch... doesn't how dumb we are or how little we know still. Mm. Not that it's that it's this is actually one of the <laughs> topics of of stars of of the concerns of of Starlink is how hard it is already with our ground base or any telescope when it's looking at the night sky and they're just looking for pixels that basically have changed in the night sky to be able to measure velocity yep. and you know all that stuff and how even just sometimes all they get is like three different shots and if you only have you know if in the middle of there there's a Starlink streak and it ruined that shot the second shot. You cannot your determine toast. your toast. Yep. So my friend yeah. uh, Johnny uh, did a really, really, really good documentary called um, "The End of Astronomy." Like, is is this the end of astronomy? And it's about Starlink. Um, and he brings up some really good points, you know, and talks to astrophysicists and, and astronomers. I was kind of the voice of like in that video. It, it's just like thirty or forty minute documentary. I kind of play the voice of like I think Starlink has a lot of potential for good, 
But of course, the professionals and the astronomers in the you know in the world are very concerned. But the, yeah, the reason is when you're something like this, you you might only have a telescope looking at yeah. you know the tiniest little portion of the sky, like the itsiest bintsiest little yeah. you know hold your hand out and make the smallest little sliver. They're staring at that for two weeks or whatever, looking for just boop, you know change of pixels. And uh, if, yeah. if a, something yeah, it's just so dim. These things are would never be visible with the naked eye they're like you know right orders right. of magnitudes too too dim and yeah it's it's pretty amazing that we find them in the first place but we definitely need more telescopes looking to be able to find and, these things before they come and smack us the 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 information we're able to gain from that very tiny amount of visible light or even radio telescopes and stuff is fascinating right i was listening to yeah um, Star Talk, and they were talking about uh, the search for life on exoplanets, and how that works, and how mm-hmm. it's it's basically a guessing game. <laughs> I mean, maybe it's not fair, but but it's like the only way to really know to see if there's life on exoplanets is to look for gases that would exist that would like be required right. for life to exist based on how we know it exists. So we could clearly be missing tons of different life forms that don't need the same things we need to exist. But point being like, and, and then we're like, uh, okay. So possibly there's life there. <laughs> like, like it's so right. far and so hard to even detect or like the signs of life are there are present. And that's about as far as it goes. Right. Like yeah. you'd never be able to communicate with them. You'd never be able to, I mean, maybe, you know, I, the, the way that they talked about it was like, yeah, like we're just, we're so at the beginning of this, that, that looking at these things so far away, isn't really about having a practical use or, or thing for them today. It's about a thousand years from now or 10,000 years from now, uh, having this study in this field, you know, and these things starting now. So that way, you know, in the future, the far distant future, we could possibly have practical use cases for that knowledge. Just like, you know, Copernicus or someone else, like, like at the time it being like, well, this is stupid. Who even cares that, you know, the, the earth revolves around the sun versus that, like you're going to prison for the rest of your life, you know, (laughs) that kind of a thing. But now we're like, actually that was really brilliant, you know? And then that led to stuff like, you know, uh, Newton's laws, like, you know, so it all kind of builds upon itself. So even if, we, you know, identify objects like a moo moo and we whatever, like just, just, or, you know, these other things seeing super far out, even though it's like such a little teeny bit of information, that little bit of information can snowball into something really amazing for our species down the road, you know, mm-hmm. yep. assuming we're all still here, I guess. <laughs> Which that's the big, be, but... that's the biggest <laughs> yeah. question. The Fermi paradox of it all. Yeah. Well, um, you know, I think we should take a, a little break here because I, I want to try to extend this podcast long enough that we get to see uh, SLS try to do the <laughs> static fire. And so far, we got about 30 more minutes here. So let's ex- let's take a little break quick and uh, we'll, we'll pop right back. And we got a, a few more things to go over. We'll be right back. Hey, everybody. We wanted to take a second to thank all of our fans out there who are supporting this channel and our individual channels. We wouldn't be anything without you. Everybody astronaut, Teslanomics, Answers with Joe. Thank you. I mean, yeah, honestly, it's this community of people. It's your comments, your likes, your shares, your subscriptions. I mean, we really wouldn't be doing any of this without you. And we really love when you guys join the conversation. Why Don't They Just is super fun each week where you submit your questions for us to try to answer uh, as best we typically can. And we wanted to let you know how to join the conversation via Patreon. Yeah. If you uh, are a Patreon member, you can join uh, our exclusive Discord channel. You can also get early access to episodes, a lot of just other little small perks. But most importantly is our our tight-knit community on Discord because there's a lot of like-minded people that you can chat with live in real time. And it's just a lot of fun uh, to see the community come together each week and listen to our recordings as we record it. That's my favorite part. Yeah. And so anyway, if you want to join, you can go to olfpod.com slash Patreon. We would love to see you there. Thanks again. And now back to our ludicrous programming. And uh, welcome back where we, uh, you know, why don't we just do, why don't they just? Why don't they just? There it is. That ray of hope that we all look forward to every week. Mm, Every day. (laughs) Every day. I'm just, why don't they just, you know? Oh, it's a (laughs) verb. You could say, why don't they justing? Justing. That's like. 
you're standing there like you know looking at your pool or something like why don't they just you know you're why don't they adjusting sweet anyway <laughs> once you once you once you once you become a verb that's when you know you've made it exactly yeah. Exactly. Uh, so true. I'm not sure actually even where to start with this, but it's interesting. So how about I just start from the tweet and work my way backwards? How about that? So this Sounds is from great. Nick someone. I'm sorry, Nick underscore someone <laughs> yeah, on Twitter. So you can't, wait, you're too cool to say his name. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, he says, why don't they just put spiral baffle in the Starship header tanks? And he did a little design here. So those just listening, sorry, you can't really see this, but it's like it's like the header tank, which is a sphere, a little ball, but inside there's basically the Guggenheim. That's a, a <laughs> circular <laughs> spiral from top to bottom. Yeah. Um and he even did a little video to show this. So this is about keeping Whoa. the sloshing down. Um and his point being that the gas at the top of the spiral could be pressurized and it would push the rest of it down and prevent uh, sloshing. So this is at the end of a long, not long, <laughs> but um, back and forth here between Chris B at NASA Space Flight and Elon Musk. Uh, they're talking about uh, you know the the various problems with the header tanks and keeping them pressurized and making it. Yep. And a little a little guy named Everyday Astronaut chimed in as well, asking if there were yep. baffles that, in future yeah. designs to prevent slosh. Yeah. Elon says yeah. there were baffles, but one may have acted like a straw to suck bubbles in from the above liquid gas level. I think we actually talked about this once before. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, something similar happened week, in yeah. early Falcon 1, resulting in unexpectedly high liquid oxygen residuals in main engine cutoff. So, next someone's solution was this helical baffle. So why don't they just? I don't think Elon responded to this, so. <laughs> uh, well, Joe, what, what, what are your initial thoughts? <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have picked this because it's way over my head. Um, <laughs> I I don't know if this is the prevention to sloshing. If like, I don't know if this is actually even something that would work. I would say the whole Why? you know Elon says the the best part is no part. So you know not having that in there would be simpler. But it's not like it's moving around or anything. I I. I don't have a good answer to this. Anybody else? Right. I'm confused ben? why it's a sphere instead of just like a straight pipe with the staircase thing. I don't know. Well, what does I, that I think it's going you? off the, the current header tank design, which oh. uh, the main reason it's it, it's a lot. It's pretty easy to manufacture a, a sphere like that. And, you know, all the pressure points are equal. You don't have any, you know, like a, a tube. You have the, the domes where they connect. Like it ends up being the simplest thing. It's just a, a straight sphere. Yeah like that mm -hmm. so yeah he was basing I'm, it off the it's uh it, it, i'll pass it's way above my head i'm not sure <laughs> what this does well, I'm a, so different. so um mystic wolf in discord just said it's the archimedes screw of space um <laughs> but that got me wondering like is this supposed to turn inside of there to like force the the liquid no, down or I something don't think so yeah no, i didn't I don't either think so i think it's just passive just a passive yeah. imagine a spiral staircase inside of a ball but it right. kind of gets skinny at the top and skinny at the bottom and, and hugs the walls all the it's way like, in between. It's like the thing you use to cut rings out of a pineapple. <laughs> oh, yeah. Have you seen that? It uh, is, yeah. <laughs> you, you, and you twist it? Yeah. There you yeah. Go. You don't so buy I, your pineapple one... from a can like a real American? <laughs> <laughs> so I see one major problem with this, actually. Okay. Um, the header tank. So this would be fine if you're you know worried about sloshing and you're trying to drain fuel straight down, I'm guessing. You know, like if you're trying to keep the liquid down at the bottom and you're pulling from the bottom. The header tank, though, doesn't pull from the bottom. It pulls from, currently it's about a 45 degree angle um, so that when it's on its side, you know, falling falling mm. through the sky when it's belly first, it needs to be able to pull liquid and not be sucking bubbles. So it's it's more towards the, the side of the tank, basically, mm. you know. Um, so this would probably hinder or hurt that. And then the other thing is, you know, this is making the strong assumptions that st spiral baffles are a really good thing to prevent sloshing. And um, can you scroll up just a tiny bit? I think he had a, a Nick had a reason for that, basically saying um, baffles make. Um, yeah, I mean, just saying like just making a statement that heli heli helical <clears throat> baffles um, 
or diagonal baffle plates with holes to mimic the, the helical baffle. I've never personally heard of a helical baffle. So I don't know, like he's making a claim that they're they're really good baffles basically and that they would prevent bubbles and slosh problems. But do they? You know, that should be the first step. It's like, I don't know. Does a spiral, <laughs> a helical baffle work better than um, other solutions? But yeah, it's also heavy. It's fairly large. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I And then it, it wouldn't be able to pull very well from the, from the bottom of the header tank. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Can yeah, I maybe, claim helical that's... baffles as a band name? Definitely. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but that's a good one though. I, I do like that. I don't, I wouldn't be surprised if there are some solutions that they come up with, you know, physical hardware that they end up putting in these things. Uh, that is something like this, you know, it might not be this entire exact thing, but Baffles are already pretty weird and they have to do some unique things to, to make them work. So yeah. Yeah. I think it's a cool idea though. Hmm. So there you go. Well, speaking of making things work, <sighs> BMW is finally getting to work on an electric car. How about that yeah. one for you? Yeah. I love it. So I'll heed your warning. Give me the link there, Tim. Pulled up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it took me a second. I'm sorry. I did so good last week. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just not on it All this right. week. He's, he's too busy looking out for SLS. Yeah, Introducing <laughs> the new BMW <laughs> i4. Uh, so yep. we all know about uh, BMW and their reluctance to go hard on EVs. I don't know which one is, is hesitation. It has seemed like it's been a little bit delayed, right? They've been a little bit behind the curve in terms of uh, really making uh, compelling electric vehicles. But um, now they have one called the uh, BMW i4. You, you may imagine it's kind of like the larger cousin to the i3. And we have some photos here. Tim's sharing them on the screen if you're watching on YouTube or if you want to, um, uh, you know, if you're just listening, you can check them out. Just Google BMW i4 photos. Uh, it's pretty, the specs are good. That's the exciting part, right? Like it's 300 miles. Uh, my screen is frozen, so I can't tell you the other specs right now. Where are we at? Um, <laughs> but it looks like we're looking at uh, they're going to be arriving at the end of 2022, so still a ways away. Um, but, you know, it'll be fast and it'll, you know, be reasonably priced. I think it's around $80,000. Uh, but, you know, 300-mile range is like finally they're building a real sedan that mm-hmm. they really, like, seem to be trying, whereas the i3... I mean, it has its place. I don't think it's really bad. Um, just for the price, I thought it was a ridiculous buy. I, I thought the BMW i3 for the p- given price is like, no, don't do that. <laughs> you can buy a Model 3 and it's like infinitely better. Um, but yeah, so so now now they have one that's coming out and it's a BMW. So like, okay, here we go. Uh, 523 horsepower, estimated 300 mile range, zero to 100 kilometers or zero to 62 miles per hour in four seconds. So not terribly quick, but that's definitely not slow. Um, and it's, you know, I do have to it's, point uh, out, it's like the BMW uh, I feel like 4 five Series. Years ago, four, four year, five years ago, zero to 60 in four seconds was blistering. For even oh, like, yeah. you know, an M4 or like any sports sedan would have been like four seconds, zero to 60, no way. And I was like, four seconds, yeah. Yeah, that's okay. That's, right. That's, it's acceptable. <laughs> well, you know. Well, it's probably it's probably comparable or or quicker <coughs> than their gas counterpart, the BMW 4. So this is essentially similar size and shape. They're saying to a BMW 4, uh, a BMW 4 Series Grand Coupe. Uh, it's a four door sedan uh, with a low coupe like uh, roof line, um, and so it's similar to let's say the Model 3, I guess in size and shape and that kind of a thing. And now. What do you guys think of the look here? Tim, could you bring that back up? I just want to get your guys' mm-hmm. opinion on on how it looks because this seems to be a bit controversial. Well, let's not forget this is basically just the the look of the 4 Series BMW, period. Like, it doesn't look that different from the non-electric version for those of you that have seen the, the right. current 4 Series BMW. Mm-hmm. It. G- give me a couple different images there, though, because I, one of these in particular is kind of jarring. I think. Yeah. How's <laughs> how's that one? How's that one rubbing you guys there? Look at that. Yeah, I def I don't love the nostrils. <laughs> I think um, BMW needs to see a urologist because I think they have kidney disease. It's 
<laughs> they're, they're very inflamed and getting bigger over yeah. time. I wish they'd give yeah. up on it. Or like, I don't know. Change, I, don't I don't even know. hate it. It's just it's just funny to see <laughs> it just keep getting bigger. It yeah. It just looks like it's go, go on over there. like go over two more, Tim. Two more photos. I don't know about the, the right. license plate going yeah, across it either. That That's one. kind of weird. Right. Yeah. But I, I mean I love the general shape of the car. I think it's a very good looking car from basically all angles. I don't love the big kidney grill thing. But then again, this is one of those things that right now we think it's jarring and hideous. But give it like a couple years and then you see an old one, you'll be like, ooh, look at those tiny, dumb little what was the point of those little tiny grills? You know, like it would probably change your perspective. And I love it. The the designer of this car uh, said one in six people like the new grill. And he claimed <laughs> it as like as a claim of success, almost like one in six. That's your metric. <laughs> that should be a <laughs> like less failure. I would not tell people that. It's like less than 20 percent, right? Yeah. Like, hey, what do you score on that test? Uh, Seventeen, yeah, sixteen yeah. percent. Uh, I I think that's uh, below failing is where that is. Uh, <laughs> that is well, so okay, bad. but you know, globally, uh, BMW does have uh, twenty five new electrified in air quotes again models uh, <laughs> that they plan to have on sale by twenty twenty three. Meaning so, it has a car battery. Yeah, yeah. I guess every car has been electrified for geez forever uh or almost forever. but in um, general yeah I, I think it i think it looks good and but i do have to, we have to remember when i was like first seeing the model three in 2017 you know, when they made that announcement that summer I was doing a lot of research on whether or not that'd be the next car at the time i was the bmw 3 series owner you know a, a mm -hmm. relatively it was kind of the most recent at the time is the f30 uh body style so the newest one at the time and i was considering at the time they're showing off their new electric three series that was supposed to come out yeah. like around the same time as the model three. Here we are. This is now maybe going to be hitting the showroom by 2022, 2023. So five years it, later. End of 2022. Yeah. Yeah. That's insane. That's so yeah. Tesla was clearly five years ahead. Yeah. Like, well, oh, easily. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the good probably, okay. So to, to, argue in favor of this car other than me looking at it and throwing up a little bit like outside of that like you know it's going to be really nice on the interior mm -hmm. and like the car part of it is going to be really well done you know that yeah, it'll be for a sure. great yeah. car yeah like bmw yeah. makes amazingly well crafted machines uh and and that's why it was always like oh yeah but you can't make the thing go more than 100 miles on a charge like so mm, you know not quite doing it uh but so anyway so if they can if they've cracked that nut and they're able to do this then i think this will be a success because uh, prob probably not in the u.s or maybe not in the u.s because i think u.s is like 80 percent of electric vehicles are teslas now or something crazy like that like some absurd amount so i i i, I would just venture to guess that that tesla like owns the U.S. Uh, electric vehicle market currently, but I don't think they, that's true for all of Europe. And when it comes to BMW, that's your like standard go-to for a lot of countries in Europe, right? So mm -hmm. I could I could see a lot of people buying this um, because they've been a BMW fan and they're mm -hmm. generationally, you know, have been. So I yeah. could see it selling well, doing well. I'm happy that they're coming out at least announcing a car with decent specs i'm curious how they're going to get there uh what battery supplier is going to be doing it because there is sort of like a shortage of a lot of these things right now i mean tesla had to shut down production of the model 3 for a little while because of a chip shortage i mean there's so many things hmm. um that that we're going to be hitting up in our supply chains i think the supply chain is going to have to evolve uh <sighs> rapidly in order to keep up with I mean, literally every automaker out there saying they're going all electric within the next, you know, seven to 10 years. Yeah. Hey, just real yeah. quick. I think I found the uh, inspiration for that grill. Oh. oh. Pretty sure that's <laughs> a beaver. Is this a woodchuck? A beaver? <laughs> this is gopher. <laughs> gopher. A gopher. Uh, gopher and woodchuck I, are the same thing. I make fun. I actually think 100%. it's nice looking. That, I know. Oh, I man. think that's 100% right. <laughs> yeah it's an odd looking oh. uh looking grill but you know i'm I'm buying a rivian and it has an odd looking grill and yeah. i've come to accept it 
sort of. Our, it's funny how we, <laughs> it our our perception on things change. Like I remember yeah. again with the F30 BMW when it first came out, the old three series compared to the the previous whatever it was. I already forgot. It's been a while, E38 or whatever. I, sorry, BMW fans. But the headlights like were really different on the F30. And I hated them at first. I was like, oh, gross. It has this little kink in it. And like, Ugh. and then uh, <laughs> really quickly, though, you're, you're, you start seeing that more and more. And then you see the old ones. And it's just like, oh, look at that old one. Those headlights are yeah. gross. Yeah. You know, I think this yeah. will happen with, with this. And, and just like Tesla Model 3 with the, with the no grill. Yeah. Oh, my God. Remember yeah. how controversial that was? And like now it's totally normal. Even I at totally first was normal. like, I don't know about that, but. But I was I, yeah. I went somewhere the other day and I was just looking at it from the side. I'm like, that's I like that. That's really nice. Yeah. That's well, my what comments. is it? Is it that we're used to it or is it the the confirmation bias thing? Like I know I know we've talked about that on the show. I know countless Tesla owners. I I, I mean you could almost it's almost a hundred percent. You could find someone that's like uh, that has had a Tesla or mini Teslas. What was your first one? Okay. What's your favorite one? Ninety nine percent of the time it's the same thing. Yeah. Has nothing yeah. to do with whether or not it's better or anything else. It's purely the human bias that we cannot avoid. Can I posit you know? a theory? Yeah. Yes. The front of a car with the headlights and everything is kind of a face. Oh, definitely. For sure. And and we are so pattern wired for pattern recognition, especially for faces and stuff and expressions and faces, that changes to it are just, I think that strikes us at a, at a primitive level in a way that maybe other design changes don't yeah that's my theory yeah, could be but and the, i also think that the one of the big things too is um once we experience a car and experience fond memories and features and all these things the lifestyle of the car and if that's a positive thing the we'll start attributing like those changes of the look to those positive attributions you know like be like oh i no, this car is super cool you know like because now we have this experience of i love this car and now I love that look, you know, and yeah. Yeah. So the, there is something about, um, and I was trying to see if I could find, find a, a diagram of, it, but a uh, Ford, uh, when I drove the Mach-E, they, their uh, chief designer or chief engineer there, Ron, I forget his last name, was explaining to me that when you design the shape of a car, and I don't know if it's, <laughs> look at that cutie. Uh, I, I, I don't know if it's, uh, just because it's some natural phenomenon that we've evolved this way, or if because cars have been around for so long, th this has become what we expect. But there's actually like a triangle that they measure, and it's something like from the center of the front wheel, you like start at the fender, but like align it with the center. You go to the top of the hood from there, and then you draw a line from there to the to the furthest point forward, like the the front of the nose of the car. And that angle, that that triangle right there, basically will will subconsciously or whatever tell you the type of car it is. So yeah, is it, if it's before. a sports car. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm sure there's a name for it. I'm sure people that are car designers know this innately. But like, that's why certain cars, like a minivan, looks like like you just think of it as like, oh, this is a big people carry with a bunch of people. It's really just the angles that you see, and and so this is not. I mean, and yeah, I don't know if that's a natural phenomenon, like how we respond to certain shapes and colors in, in sort of a natural way that is not learned behavior, like you can test it in babies, but. But yeah, there's something there, right? And so the Model S was one that definitely followed that proportion design of like a typical sports car. And the Model 3 really did not because it the nose was way shorter. And so I think mm -hmm. what you're talking about, that that initial reaction you probably had when you first saw it might have been, you know, partly related to the change in proportions of, of that triangle. Uh, but then now over time, We've adjusted to it. So there's like a different phenomenon going on. It really is fascinating how, I don't know, how like our brains play these tricks on us and we we get a feeling, but we don't understand the source of that feeling. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like the term yeah. uh, uncanny valley mm -hmm. uh, was coming to know. mind. You're not familiar with that term? Yeah. Mm -mm. So Robots. Robots and like CGI characters. There's a reason why it's really hard to get like photorealistic CGI characters. They've gotten a lot better about it fairly recently, but but even still, like, um, 
well, not to spoil the Mandalorian, but the season two uh, big reveal in the last episode of the guy that I guess I don't want to kill it for everybody. Anyway, um, Uncanny Valley is this whole thing of like looking really close to reality, but not quite so that your brain is just it's like it's really creepy. So it's like the closer you get to photorealistic, the more creepy it looks. That's why most of Pixar's uh, animation is very cartoony. You know, they don't try to do like Final Fantasy kind of thing. Right. Uh, Because the closer you get to that, Mm. just the weirder and creepier it gets. You know, that's that's fascinating because the Polar Express. Remember that movie? Mm -hmm. Yes. It's like it's an animated movie. and It's Tom Hanks and stuff. Uh, So so Jenny, my wife. uh, Well, she doesn't like Tom Hanks for one, but that movie creeps her out. She says she. Yeah, I don't know either. Tom (laughs) Hanks is is a national treasure. I don't know. We disagree on that a lot. But. But point being, something about the faces of the characters in that movie and how they're animated yes, exactly. really it. just yeah. rubs her. She's just like, Ugh, this is creepy mm-hmm. looking. Why is it? Yes, that's uh, Uncanny Valley. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yep. Right, right. And then, of course, this is the, the movie that my son wants to watch on repeat 10,000 times in a oh, row. No. So, yeah, you yeah. Know. I think there was you something know, this when, is what being when, a parent is like. In like the <laughs> late 90s, early 2000s, when when they really started to use a lot of CGI and thought like they, they got a little too big for their britches and you wind up with mm. like the rocks character and the scorpion King. That's just like made out of Play-Doh basically. And um, <laughs> just like really bad CGI where they thought that they could possibly make it photorealistic and it just was not ready yet. Um, yeah, but but yeah. the polar express is definitely in that category. Speaking of yeah. photorealistic, we have <gasps> some photorealistic renders Dun, dun, dun. That came out from NASA of a spacecraft that a lot of us have been waiting to hear more about. So I don't mm. know if you guys remember is about a year ago now. Um, we kind of caught wind all of a sudden that there's just going to be this Dragon XL capsule. Just no no information besides just like one picture. Uh, I was like, a, I think it was a tweet. And it's just like, oh, by the way, Dragon capsule XL, Dragon XL. It's going to be going out to the Lunar Gateway. Ta-da, you know, and uh, we knew nothing else about it. So since then, it's still been like hilariously quiet. We have not heard almost anything. But then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, um, there was this uh, out of nowhere as of today. Was that today? This No, yesterday. Um, so Wednesday, the 17th, NASA uploaded some new renders of the Dragon XL capsule. And it's becoming more and more apparent that it looks to quite literally basically be the same um, you know, a lot of people were speculating that it's probably built out of the same fuselage material or like part of the fuel tanks of a Falcon 9, just a simple like a cylindrical body. Yep. Um, so it'd still be inside the payload fairing, most likely. Um, but you know, it's just a simple construction method they're already using. It's a simple pressure vessel. Um, and then it has a, the trio, like it's got its own propulsion. You know, it's got a, a trio of thrusters and stuff like that. The large solar panels kind of more like a, more akin to like the Draco one or the mm-hmm. Dragon one. Um, but yeah, we don't still know a ton about this other than we finally got some new images to go over. And yeah, I guess this is information of some kind, but it's not really telling us anything else about <laughs> anything else about it, really. Is this supposed to be yeah. crude? No, this this one will not be crewed. This is just a a resupply cargo for the crew that will be on eventually the gateway, the yeah, around the moon. Okay. So I like that it has the old school retro thrusters on the side. Yeah. Yeah. I like that too. Like Apollo. Which which is basically what's inside of a like a Dragon 2 capsule. There's only a three like that at 120 degree um, Uh angles, but they're but they're built into the wall, like they're cantered or cantered right. what's it where they kind of like slice them um against the fuselage so um these are, are just the straight horns basically you know the straight bells uh-huh. without having to 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 slice the angles off on them to, to be able to match the the line of the <laughs> the outer the outer mold line of the vehicle. slicer is yeah, this but it's super cool spacex making this right so the spacex will be making this yep okay because i, I yeah. just heard nasa i thought it was like nasa was making it well, NASA like posted this, which is weird. Like SpaceX still hardly hasn't said anything, and and NASA posted. So, it. I mean, it is it, they're NASA missions. It'll be NASA Gateway missions, right? But um, huh. but it's just weird that we haven't hardly heard anything. And then there's that. Yeah, 
I don't know. They've been XL wow. quiet about it. Ooh. <laughs> And is that the name wow. they're going with, or is it going to be like Dragon Max Plus or something? You know, <laughs> they're they're not a streaming network. Yeah, <laughs> Dra- Dragon phone. Max Pro. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pro Two <laughs> Extreme. Oh, please uh, no! I don't want that. Um, I, but SpaceX also is doing something else that's kind of secretive-ish. That is, uh, people are mm. starting to put the pieces together here. So. Um, so Gavin Cornwell, who manages an awesome Twitter account called SpaceX Fleet, has this picture of this beautiful blue or dare I say it, blue origin esque blue <laughs> boat with a blue ship that's white and then has a hot pink streak on it. Um, and Ooh. notices there's a lot of people starting to put some stuff together um, that it's uh, likely going to be replacing uh go tree miss like miss go tree and and uh miss mischief mischief gosh yeah um (laughs) (laughs) um so yeah go sorry miss tree and mischief are out of service um they have not been trying to catch the fangs anymore they're just recovering them and it's actually been more or less uh they uh they've been using uh go go navigator and go searcher to be able to pluck the fairings out of the water. And they've had more success with that. And as a matter of fact, mm. they've been reusing the ones out of the water more than the ones that they've been trying to catch. So That's the ones right. that they catch have been like, you know, they've been dangerous, I think. Like they have broken some of the equipment on the ship because they're big. Don't forget, this is a yeah. big thing. Yeah. You know, it's like a school bus falling out of the sky trying to land it in a net. So SpaceX has basically given up on this and they think this thing is big enough to hold four fairing halves, which of course would never, you never need to hold four unless there's two back-to-back missions. I guess, you know, Starlink these days are, are going so quickly along the same orbital inclination that it might make sense for them to keep it parked out there for a couple more days, be able to recover two missions worth of fairings um, and then bring them back. Cause it's not cheap going out there and back and out and back and out and back and the, the crew time and the, the gas and all this stuff. Um, so it's it's pretty well speculated this could replace uh go uh <laughs> miss chief and miss tree uh <laughs> yeah which i don't know why i'm having such a hard time saying it. but now yeah, th- these are parked so greg scott had some awesome pictures uh, of it parked in port canaveral and it is it's big it's a lot bigger than the other boats hmm. um there's lumber behind it ignore the lumber behind it but um yeah it's it's a big boat so it, this could be a great solution for them to be able to recover, um, you know, the fairings easily. So, yeah. Very cool. Pretty cool. Very cool. Who would have thought we'll that see. SpaceX gotta... would be making so many boats? <laughs> or <laughs> buying so many boats. Yeah. Yeah. Or the they don't... platforms too. I'd... Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. They operate such a large marine fleet, you know, like that is, hey, you guys are a rocket company, but you also operate how many boats? <laughs> <laughs> we get more boats and rockets. I, I wonder. I mean, not not that this would happen to them, but there are. Uh, it seems like a very large number of of tales like that of stories where a company did one thing, but in order to do that thing, they had to do this other thing, and then later it turns where out that was like the, the thing. biggest. That, that, yeah, right. like, like, like uh, yeah, I think there's times I mean, where it turns out a company's like the biggest manufacturer of you know something else, and they had no intention to ever do that. They were just trying to do something yeah. else, you know. I can't, yeah, can't think of a uh, good it, example. It, but my first job in tech, corporate job, was at a, a a now gone phone company called MCI, and they were at the time one of the big, biggest telecommunications company in the world, and they started out as a trucking company, believe it or not. And so they had a trucking company on the East Coast, you know, delivering stuff, whatever. And they had built a series of uh, microwave antennas to communicate between their trucking fleet. So I don't know why they chose that, but so, you know, that led them into the telecommunications business. Mm -hmm. And then they built the UUNet, which is like, you know, one of the main backbones of the Internet. So you're just like, this is nuts. Like you started as a trucking company, but now you're like basically the world's internet provider, you know? And then of course, you know, humans. So accounting scandal, bankruptcy, get bought out, et cetera, et cetera. Now it's Verizon. So yeah, you get all that. Um, We have some breaking news guys. Can can we, can we talk about this, Tim? Can you pull up this link I just sent you? Sorry to to throw it off here. Uh, Rivian just announced they're charging 
infrastructure, network, et cetera, et cetera. Big questions that I personally had as my family's looking to do a road trip in July, at the end of July, and I've been emailing them nonstop, like, where the hell am I going to charge this thing? <laughs> What's the plan? Right. Here we go. Uh, not to say that I, you know, uh, inspired that, but we have the information now. <laughs> um, so Rivian is building the Rivian Adventure Network. It's uh, going to be very fast, you know, as it, as it ran. Um, and this is a, a nationwide network of DC fast chargers capable of adding up to 140 miles of range in 20 minutes in the R1T and R1S. And let me just point out that the R1T and R1S are very large vehicles, bigger than any other electric vehicles out there today, right? You think the Model X is like, this is like way bigger than that. This is like F-150 size electric vehicles mm -hmm. we're talking about, Ra Range Rover size electric vehicles. So to add 140 miles to one of those is an even bigger feat or whatever. Um, the map that if you scroll up a little bit, you can see is very similar to what you might imagine of the supercharger network or something like that. These are all the sites, 3,500 uh, fast chargers, meaning these DC level three fast chargers at 600 sites by the end of next year. So I'm not sure, and no, we'll get the through end this. Of this is like literally, by right. the end of 2023. Oh, I'm sorry, 2023. See, I'm years. living in the ludicrous future already. <laughs> Look at that. Um, one of the interesting things about this is that there are quite a few planned, and I'm not sure that this map really explains it well, there are quite a few planned at places that are not common. So like they may put a whole giant charging station at like Yosemite or Yellowstone mm -hmm. or places that would be places you want to go in, in this adventure kind of context. Uh, but, you know, Tesla may not put a giant supercharging station there because it's not a travel route, which was the idea behind the supercharger That's network cool. was to enable I'm long seeing that travel. just looking at the map, look at the distribution, like in the mountains and, mm -hmm. you know, the yeah, Smoky Colorado, Mountains and the Utah. Rocky Mountains. And Alaska. Yeah, actually, Alaska, yep. Actually, really look at, cool. can, can you zoom in on, on your browser at all? Because sure. um, if you look at the to. East Coast of the U.S., um, if you look at the East Coast of the U.S., there's like that, I think they, they chose a terrain map intentionally, but look at that, I don't know what this is. There's like a whole mountain range here that's that Appalachian extends. Appalachian Mountains. There you go. Yep. <laughs> I've, not, I've not been over there, okay? Uh, from It extends all the way from one of the states that's near Florida. I don't know. Is that Georgia, maybe? <laughs> Do you want me to describe like this Carolina? on the air? So South Carolina, yeah, yeah, Virginia, go. what? <laughs> Tell me what we're talking about here. Okay. Tell me what we're looking at. So this is the Appalachian Mountains, and they clearly have it dotted all the way along, basically going from Georgia and Alabama um, all the way up to New York and, you know, basically to the end of the Appalachians and, and into eventually like New Hampshire, Vermont, and even up towards Maine all the way along kind of that, that which is a popular in place Canada for, you too. know, like, yeah, uh, you know, this is popular areas for camping and um, off-roading and stuff. And look at how many in Atlanta even. I mean, it's but like, look impressive. at the the Great Lakes, like yeah. at the very tippy top of the Great Lakes, right? The upper. I don't imagine of that's. Yeah, I don't imagine that's a very traveled route, right? That's probably not a place where you would see a forty station Tesla supercharger thing, right? Right, but this Maybe is totally like the outdoor land, you know, like the right. Cabela's of the nation, where people will go and fish for you know two weeks in a cabin. Like this is, you mm -hmm. know, Upper Peninsula and the North Shore <clears> of Minnesota. <throat> Um, this is very much that off-roading, you know, living off-grid situation. And um, ironically, obviously, living off-grid is not an option that, you know, you have to have some kind of grid. But um, they clearly are are going for that, which is really cool to see. Yeah. I actually really like that. What, Tim, where, can you show me where Iowa is? Because how many... Iowa's right here. I, I think they, don't, it's... they don't think we're very adventurous. It's um, <laughs> it's the one... Is, it's that one? Yeah, I, can, I don't know if you which can see one? my mouse. The, okay, this one yeah. right here that has literally only two inside of it. So they're doing Des Moines and Iowa City and then Omaha slash the Council guy. Bluffs on the left and the Quad Cities on the on the east. And north of that would be Albert Lee, Minnesota. So that's the, almost the exact mm. supercharger so far that we have in, in Iowa, too. Yeah. So, so those, those are probably more. Yeah, yeah. I-80 going across there and Interstate 35 going north to south. So they're just trying to get their their interstate yep. Yep. coverage there. Um. It'll be powered 100% by renewable energy, they say, uh, through partnerships with electricity providers. Uh, they'll use wind and solar whenever possible, as well as renewable energy certificates to ensure that your vehicle is powered with clean 
electricity. That's kind of a nice touch. I remember Tesla talking about that a lot. It's just not really feasible to like stand up a solar farm in Burbank or something. <laughs> so uh, it's harder to do. But yeah, there's what this this uh, station looks like. You can see a photo there. Uh, looks kind of like an ATM with a charging plug sticking out of it. I think Casper um, said it was a PS5. <laughs> okay. <laughs> PS5. Yeah, recharger. there you go. Yeah. Uh, now, w I mean, it's funny that this has to even be a bullet point here. Um, it says automatic charging. You just pull uh, up and plug in. Uh, because out, if you are a Tesla owner, that's how you, where your experience is. You literally have no clue. You just get there, plug, good to go, right? Yeah. Every other charging network, every other EV, not like that. Even in other parts, like even really awesome ones like Electri America or Ionity in Europe can be very uh, cumbersome or messy to try to get going. This, uh, you know, uh, th will solve that. So in vehicle nav, automatically planned. So that's what we expect. Uh, you know, that's what we, w well, I guess, unless we're VW, uh, <laughs> that's what we would hope for. Um, a charging rates of initially over 200 kilowatts uh, and trying to get to uh, 300 kilowatts plus in the future. That's super challenging, but they do have giant battery packs here. So it is more feasible, I would say, than like trying to do that in like the new Fiat electric car or something like that. Um, and then they're also installing, uh, they say, thousands of waypoint chargers. These are like what you would consider destination chargers for Tesla. They're level twos. They can deliver 25 miles of range every hour. So this is like, in fact, I mean, we may go back to this now because we, we literally sat down two nights ago, Jenny and I, and we're like, okay, we want to do this trip up the coast of California to visit family in Portland, uh, maybe go over to Montana and come back. And we're just looking at it going... It's going to take us, you know, six weeks to do this because charging and we don't know where to go because it's a Rivian and it's not whatever. Um, now that they're going to have these destination chargers, the idea would be you would plan that out. So you land at one, you can end up there with relatively low charge, plug in overnight, next day, you're good to go. Um, and they're looking at over 10,000 of these uh, through 2023. Uh, they have, uh, you know, lots of state parks and stuff like that. And you can see the waypoint charger there. Um, and then down below, they also have the, uh, the, uh, at home charger, if you scroll down quite a bit and, uh, this will be something that I absolutely am getting hundred <laughs> percent. Uh, yeah. although, although I, I have looked at, I mean, I guess maybe not, but I, I have looked at other EV chargers and thought about trying to partner with one of them because the challenge, and this is like maybe, you know, early digital camera adopters where you had like your SD card that only worked in the Sony camera and you're real frustrated with it. Well, J, uh, the J1772 plug and the CCS chargers are fairly standard now. I would say they're widely adopted. I mean, in other countries everywhere, like in even Tesla has adopted them in Europe. Um, but me at my house, I only have Tesla chargers. So that sucks because if I'm buying a Rivian, I literally don't have a way to charge it. Uh, now, here you go. So, and the cool thing about this one is that it has that J1772 adapter, that plug, meaning if we buy a Ford Mach-E or I don't know, whatever else, a Porsche Taycan maybe, you know, get, get, once once Elon starts pushing that Dogecoin again, what, maybe we can afford one. <laughs> um, we'll be able to, you know, we'll be able to charge any EV because it uses a standard plug, which is really cool. So that's about it for this, but that's, man, I'm so hyped right now. If you could tell. <laughs> so I'm, what's the difference just, between the J1772 plug and the CSS? I get those confused. CCS? C oh, see? Uh, see how confused I am? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, it, the CCS has like, they actually, I believe, share the top portion. Oh, okay. Um, it, and, and then the CCS has two extra ones on the bottom. Like, I don't know if you, Tim, you want to Google and find an image, you could show that. But <laughs> usually what happens is you'll see... Uh, the the plug that has CCS capability with the two bottom ones covered up on right. like a little a little flap yeah. and then you plug the J1772 into the top part uh -huh. and then when you need the CCS you flip that down and then you plug it in to all of them gotcha. um, and those are probably less common yeah there you go so yeah so CCS is kind of in the middle bottom row and then where's the J1772 is right that above right it. above it yeah yeah, so you can see that basically it's the similar uh, part there, okay. and then the the two bottom parts give you the extra extra voltage. So those I guess are you could say, sort of wires. interchangeable. Like you can use you a, a CCS you, plug you in a J one seven two. No, you can't plug you, in a J seven. 
Yeah, you get one a circle or a square is a rectangle, but a rectangle is not a square, right? It's the J seventeen seventy two goes into a car that is has a CCS uh, fast charging uh, ad- uh, port, uh-huh. but the, the but the CCS cannot go into it if it didn't have a CCS on the other side. But you wouldn't see that. Um, the thing you would see is Chatamo, which I don't know if if uh, yeah you can kind of see yeah. yeah which is in Japan essentially. Um, and I think China as well is Chatamo. I can't see; it's too small on my screen. Uh, anyways, yeah, but but CCS is is North America and Europe has become the the standard essentially for fast charging. Um, Tesla has their own, and I think that's fine because mm-hmm. they built it way before anyone else. So they had to do something, so they just came up with it. Uh, the, you know, the the dumb part about it is that they didn't have. Like the, it would be fine if everyone else adopted the same thing they did, right? And we all have the same standard, mm-hmm. but you know, there's adapters. It's not terribly uh, difficult to 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 make those work. They can be expensive though. Like an adapter for uh, Chatamo to Tesla or something is like four hundred and fifty bucks, or something like that. It's yeah. it's kind of a lot. Like CCS so, you kind of have to have like expensive too. Yeah, yeah, you kind of have to have like a real strong use case of like, oh, I go this one place. This is all they got. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, Otherwise, like you would just drop that money yeah, sorry go ahead yeah. joe <laughs> i was gonna ask Too as bad. a tesla owner what adapter should i have just well, in case i can't find the, a supercharger and i'm on a J1770, road trip that j1772 comes with the car okay you know so that mm-hmm. and that's that's all i have and that's all i've ever used because that's lots okay. of destination chargers and stuff um but yeah that should be pretty much enough to be honest but the other one that's more tempting for me is css because or C- CCS. CCS, dang it, because yeah. uh, like the Electrify America stuff, if you want the really fast charging, it is, yeah. it is yeah. CCS. So I, I would recommend, so what I have like in Jenny's car is, yeah, we have the one that Tesla gave us, right, which has, uh, well, okay, so we had to buy a DEMA 1451, so I'd recommend that one if you didn't get one. I think, Joe, at the time you got your car, they were giving those out for free. Mm-hmm. So the NEMA 1451 is good because that's kind of like a standard dryer outlet. Yeah. Uh, then there's also NEMA, I think it's NEMA 1430 is the other one. That's pretty common. Um, so like, let's say you, you I don't know, it, somewhere in Texas, no, you're running out. You could probably find someone's house that has one of those mm-hmm. plugs. And that would give you uh, effectively double of what a regular outlet would give you. Right. Yeah. So then, last worst resort is an actual just uh, 120 uh, adapter, which I think you also get uh, yeah. free with thing. Um, so that that is worst case, you're staying overnight in order to, to get back on the road for that. But it's it's totally viable. It's a, it's a good option. You know, definitely should have. And then there's also one I got. I forget where I got it from. There's a guy. He has a channel called the Tech of Tech. I think it is, and it's actually really cool. He does some really interesting looks at tesla stuff and he's also like uh yeah i think he's in virginia and he has a gun channel like with over a million subscribers so he's all about like hunting and guns and stuff and then he has a tesla channel essentially which is it's kind of the most interesting juxtaposition Mm -hmm. um but it's cool he's really smart i like yeah i I, i've seen some of his videos and i really like it because i think it's an underrepresented portion of the community you know it would be yeah it's, it's hilarious to me it always made sense to me my friends that like are you know, the red blooded Americans that only want to, you know, you know, drink beer, shoot guns, you know, work on cars and America, America, America. Like they should love Tesla more than anyone. You know, right. it's like you can you can produce your own power, like be completely electric, you know, completely self-sufficient. This thing's made in the U.S., designed in the U.S. It's got more tour. You know, like I always tout like that should be the ultimate like America symbol to me. So it is fun to see that because it is happening now where I think some people are, yeah. are, are if you want to, you know, have that beating of your chest attitude, I think that I'm surprised we're not seeing more of that, but yeah. Well, and a big thing there that is under uh, underrated is that your fuel, whether or not you make it yourself from solar panels, your fuel is 100% American made. You're not getting mm-hmm. that electricity from imported from Saudi Arabia, mm-hmm. like you might be with your gasoline. Right. Yep. So if you really want to be hardcore nationalist, like, yeah, right. like, like there's something, nothing more nationalist right. about like you, all the parts, all everything. Uh, anyways. Um, yeah. That's yeah. So, so course, he, the, yeah, there's going to be people yeah. like the batteries he, come he from. A, it's like, yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> he, uh, uh, on his channel, he did uh, this really cool 
camping video in I think a Model Y or Model 3 and he showed a cooler that you could plug in to the car and have it maintain like a refrigerator but it was all self-contained it just and it fit perfectly in the like undercarriage of the trunk and I'm like that's brilliant that's what we need um mm-hmm. that's how I found it but he would go camping with it and he had this adapter for RV outlets too so I forget which one it was but it was like uh uh for the for their 240 volt uh, plug that mm-hmm. they have for RV spots when you're camping. It was an adapter from that to the NEMA 1430, I believe. Mm-hmm. So essentially, if you go camping, or let's say, again, you're <coughs> literally right. looking for a place to charge, you might be able just to go hit up a camping ground for an hour or two hours and be like, hey, I just need to charge. Can I do that? I'll pay you, whatever. Um, and so th- so we have that adapter in Jenny's car as well. So if we ever wanted to go camping in the car, we could charge from That's an also, RV thing while yes, we're Yes, I also made my dad buy that as well for his Model Y. Cause I do. Yeah, that's and it's a like great thirty bucks. Backup. It's not. Yeah, I think it's fifty. But yeah, that's exactly. a great backup if you're on a road trip and you're in a total pinch. Like lots of times you can find, um, you know, find a. But that, that's happening less and less these days, especially seeing this map that you just showed. You know, the with yeah. Rivian. By the time twenty twenty three comes around and Tesla, by the t- that time they're rolling out superchargers like you wouldn't believe. I mean, I think most of these range issues and stuff are pretty well solved. It's not going to be a capacity issue of having enough to support all of the new people trying to charge on yeah. trips and stuff. Mm-hmm. It, it, it is it is a little uh, like the fact that most car, I think all, yeah, all Teslas in North America don't support CCS. I, I would like them to see, to see them switch over to that. I think that would be cool. But I guess then all the superchargers in North America wouldn't work. So you'd have to like give an adapter for that, which is super expensive. So I, I guess I understand yeah. why they wouldn't want to do that. But it would be really great if we all were on the same one. Because imagine... Yes, you have the supercharger network, but you could also use this Rivian network. And this Rivian network is in these places that the Tesla network isn't, you know, and then mm-hmm. Electrify America is also mm-hmm. there, you know, in the event you, you know, need to do that right. or whatever. So it would, it really would make sense, I think, to have sort of a federal standard for this, like an actual regulation. Um, I, I, I'm usually the last person to recommend the government decide something like this, but since what we're talking about, it, it's almost like, um, with, with your cell phone, if you remember, it used to be like, uh, GSM networks could all play to play on each other. So that way Verizon could, Verizon calls could be carried on the T-Mobile network or whatever. Well, mm-hmm. that was, didn't have to be that way. You know, in South America, it's not that way. That's why phones in South America have multiple SIM cards. So, because if you have right. different networks, it's like an extremely long distance call. So what you do is you have multiple SIM cards that automatically switch between what network you're, you're calling on. Um, but, you know, they, I think it was called the GSM Alliance. I don't know if that was a federal thing or whatever, but like they all got together and said, no, 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 it is better for all of us mm-hmm. if there's a standard. Like imagine if you're making electric vehicles, whoever you are, if you can say every single charger in, in this country, of which now there are 50,000, you can use. And you may have to pay more at certain ones or not, but it's there for you. I think that makes the, the argument for electric vehicles just more compelling. Right, and yeah. the more the more compelling that argument it is, the better we all are as electric vehicle makers. But maybe I'm just a yeah. hippie. I don't know. I've got a story. Joe's brewing something. But first, I yeah. want to do this. So, um, we're talking about the 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 um, the expansion of uh, Rivian's charging network and everything. Did anybody mm-hmm. follow the Volkswagen Power Day thing? Oh. Yeah, the battery no. thing, yeah, right? Yeah, Volkswagen had a battery day, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I haven't really had a chance to see it, but I thought it was worth bringing up anyway. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, hang on, let me, let me find it real quick. I don't know it was, about it. They talked about they, like, legit have a solid-state battery, right? Uh, I think they talked, well, they have something called the Unified Battery Cells, the Unified Prismatic Cell Design. Um, uh-huh. I think that's what they talked about the most week. here. Right. Maybe. Yeah. Right. Uh, so I just pulled up this article from The Verge just, just talking about the biggest announcements from the Battery Day event. Again, I didn't check. It was a two-hour presentation, and I haven't had a chance to really watch it, so this is just kind of flying off the seat of my pants like I always do. But, um, but yeah, <laughs> it's saying starting in 2023, they plan to roll out a new unified prismatic cell design. Uh, it'll be installed across all the automakers' brands. Uh, and power up to 80% of their electric vehicles by 2030. And the goal is to get the battery production down below $100 uh, per kilowatt. 
kilowatt hour as we all want it to get to. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's that. Uh, so so there's there's that. Um, they're talking about building gigafactories of their own. They, there were like two or three in 20 Europe. 20 of them, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Several of them in Europe. They got a charging expansion to get 18,000 charging points in Europe by 2025. Um, mm. And they're on track to get 800 stations in the U.S. <laughs> by the end of For 2021. Electrify, electrify America. Yeah, electrify America. Yeah, mm-hmm. but that stations... The funny thing about Electrify America is the stations... You know, you go to a Tesla charging sta- or a Tesla supercharger station, and like sometimes there's like 40 stalls. It's like absurd mm-hmm. how many there are, mm-hmm. and I've never seen an Electrify America one with more than like six. Yeah, four. So seems I'm sure they're out there. Like, in fact, uh, Santa Monica Tesla just opened, or I don't know if it's just permitted or where they're at, but they're opening a V3 supercharger station in Santa Monica with 62 stalls mm-hmm. in Santa Monica. Mm-hmm. That's I mean, the crazy. real estate alone yeah. is like $10 million or something yeah, right. just for a parking lot. Like, bananas. Yeah. Well, I always get know? confused when they talk about charging stations versus charging units, I guess. Stalls. Stalls, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. they're like, we're installing yeah, 10,000 stalls. stalls. And it's like, that's, you know, well, not as many. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So this one might be the yeah. most exciting. They're talking about starting in 2022, the MEB electric vehicle platform will support bi-directional or two-way charging. Ooh, vehicle to vehicle grid. Vehicle to grid. That's super yeah, exciting. Baby. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a little picture here of a robotic charger. Oh, oh, right. This, it'll automatically charge it or something, right? Yeah. Doesn't it come to you? Or yeah. am I, yeah, I've seen the, the renderings of, um, like in parking garages, you could just pull up and the, these little, you know, Star Star Wars droids will go over there and charge up your mm-hmm. car, charge put a little up. juice in it. Um, anyway, so th- those are the main bits that are here on The Verge. Obviously, there's a lot more. I just thought it was worth bringing up. And if people want to go and check it out, um, I invite you to do so. <laughs> yeah, and they, I think their stock went up quite a bit. Uh, after that day, I think they got investors really hyped on it. And remember, Volkswagen is what the second or third largest uh, producer mm-hmm. maker of cars in the world, or something. Volkswagen Group has like fifteen or nineteen brands. Yeah, you know, Audi, Porsche, yeah. Lamborghini, Bugatti. Like, a, they have tons of them. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. A lot of them that aren't even available here in the U.S. Right. Yeah. Uh, Citroen, I think somebody check. But anyway, Seat. yeah. So Volkswagen isn't. Fiat, yeah, or no? Uh, uh, S E A T. I know it's not. Spo- I know it's not oh. pronounced seat, seat, <laughs> but it's spelled seat. Yeah. It is. Is it? Uh, well, I. Th- I mean, no, I think I've heard it's, Robert Llewellyn call it seat. Seat. Yeah, it's yeah, because it's uh, Spanish, I believe. Yeah. Show it to me. Seat. In, in <laughs> Spain. Yeah, S-E-A-T. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Andy Definitely Law says say at. So. How about say at. Whatever. It's like yeah, Hyundai. Lot, Nobody can big deal. figure out how to say it. <laughs> it's a fun day and a Hyundai. <laughs> By the way, well, I have uh, one more story. I'm still, um, yeah, well, I'm just before you get to that, I'm gonna just mention yeah. I am watching the SLS Hot Fire because they're getting they are starting to try to do something. So we'll probably end this episode right before they try to Hot Fire, which is just <laughs> hilariously perfect. So well, we'll if, have to talk about it next week then. If something happens while I'm finishing up here, just cut me off. Deal. In fact, All the right. audience is like, "Please cut Joe off." <laughs> no, I, you're, For, you're, this story was crazy. I what like is this, this story. story you're talking about. Yeah, let's hear it, Joe. Oh, just some unknown bacteria never before seen by science discovered out in space. What? Yeah. What? Actually, what? <laughs> like, it's like actually What's that's that's, that's actually what it is. Um, that's a big deal. So let's see. There, somewhere in here, it actually shows where they found it. So it says researchers from the United States and India working with NASA have now discovered four strains of bacteria living in different places in the ISS, three of which were, until now, completely unknown to science. Oh, wow. That's insane. That's crazy. Was well, it just because they're Old in their own good. micro, like they're on their own little, you know, habitat basically and they evolve differently, or what's going on? I mean, they go into it a little bit here. My assumption is just that bacteria evolve and mutate so fast that, you know, just the little uh, micro environment up there, they just kind of did their own thing and 
spawned off their own little types of bacteria but they, they are all sort of related so it says um three of the four strains are isolated wait hang on let me get back oh actually this is kind of interesting um one was found in the overhead panel of the iss research stations the second was found in the cupola a cupola however you say that mm-hmm. uh, the third was found on the surface of a dining table which i didn't even know they had dining tables in the iss like <laughs> Do you have to Velcro your food to it? Like, how does that work? <laughs> um, and the fourth was found in an old HIPAA filter that was returned to Earth in 2011. Um, so they fa- they belong to a family of bacteria found in soil and fresh water. They're involved in nitrogen fixation, plant growth, and can help stop plant pathogens. Uh, so they're good bacteria, especially if you want to be growing things. And they're actually talking about how studying this, I think they say down at the bottom here, um, that uh oh here we go this will further aid in the identification of genetic determinants that might potentially be responsible for promoting plant growth under microgravity conditions and contribute to the development of self-sustainable plant crops for long-term space missions in the future so there's actually some cool stuff that could come out of this i mean outside of just we found new bacteria living in space (laughs) you know i mean that's kind of mind-blowing still like i'm i'm scared i don't know (laughs) And and there's a there's a seg- okay there's a little quote here that Tim this is why you and I exist as science communicators because this is how like scientific studies are written the whole genome oh, sequence wait. assembly of these three ISS strains reported here will enable the comparative genomic characterization of ISS isolates with Earth counterparts in future studies. Yep. Translator needed here. What? Is that a joke? I, yeah. I just assumed that was funny. <laughs> yeah, that was the punchline. That was a joke. That's that's a science joke. <laughs> that's I, you didn't catch it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So anyway, there. That's interesting. That's very interesting. Yeah. If, if you, you want to read like, all the I wonder stuff, what we'll, I wonder what they'll like learn or have figured out because of this. You know, it's that's wild though. Well, uh, so again, like apparently these are, these are tied in with plant growth and nitrogen fixation and stuff. So, um, so it might be a useful thing when, when we, when it comes to actually growing plants on the way to Mars, when we get to Mars, that kind of thing. Life finds a way. Finds a way. There you go. There it is. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I love Jeff Goldblum. Yeah. So is that going to be in your next, uh, is that going to be in your next video, Joe? Four what bacteria strains that about? might kill you on the ISS? No. Um, I am... Well, okay. The title, I believe, will be The Return of Space Planes. Ooh, cool. Ooh. Ooh. It's specifically about the Dream Chaser from uh, Sierra Nevada, but mm-hmm. it kind of goes into the whole history of space planes and uh, you know where they might go in the future. And Did why... you talk about dinosaur? I do bring up dinosaur. Yes. Yeah. There's a lot more than Good. I thought. That I knew about, and yeah. they go way back to like World War II. Dang. There was a yeah. there was a, a, a German uh, space plane that the idea was it would skip off the atmosphere and deliver bombs to the United States. It was called the Silver Vogel or Silver Bird. Wow, awesome. well, not yeah. awesome, but that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't it have been awesome if they made that skip um, along <laughs> the atmosphere? That sounds not like that would work. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, mm-hmm. isn't that sort of what, uh, sh- what was it? The X-15 is, is, is talked about in the video. I, th- I think that's sort of the similar idea, but it's like once it gets above the atmosphere, it can kind of just, it's like skipping a rock across a pond, you know? It if you're going fast like enough. like burn up though? Yeah, I feel like, I don't know. Yeah, yeah it sounds, to sounds a degree, like it would hit you, the atmosphere you use, like, you know. Well, it has a lifting body, so you can do a little bit of that. Hmm. Yeah. I wonder if like the cool. top of the atmosphere has a little bit of like surface tension to it. Kind of like the surface of water in a sense. Mm. Yeah. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Shower thoughts with Joe. So, anyway, uh, <laughs> what are you working on, Ben? <laughs> well, next week I get to go drive the Bolt EUV. Ooh. So I will be uh, sharing my thoughts and feelings as I do. <laughs> Um, after getting a day with that. So Chevy invited me up, driving up to cool. LA, doing that thing. I'm really excited about this because just that, uh, I, I mean, the Bolt itself, I think is a great vehicle, especially at the price point and the <coughs> functionality and like everything it offers. I think it's it's a really compelling product and this promises to be just a little bit better. So hoping it delivers and yeah. uh, I'm excited to check it out. Cool. That's and awesome. Tim, yeah. Is the studio finally set up? 
oh no, 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 no. All the gear came in this week finally. <laughs> so the, it's every day there's some big project here. I mean, it to do this, to try to do this really, really right so that we're really prepared for the future here because, you know, we got to be ready. Like, I want this thing to be done, reliable, turn on, like just go, go crazy uh, by, you know, by the first orbital launch, which, you know, as we talked about earlier, might be as early as July, but you know, that's going to be the big one. That's going to be the biggest test, the biggest stream I'll ever do. So I want to make sure everything is just like really rocking. So on Sunday night, um, I have Andrew, my, you know, producer that helps. That's also a video wizard and Ben Steinman, who is uh, my networking wizard. They're coming here. We're building out this huge, like we're getting a, it's a giant server rack that'll have everything mounted and all the networking gear and all the, and we're punching a hole in the wall so we can plug in our cameras directly to the outside of the, of the studio. So we don't have to run cables through the walls or through the doors or anything. Like it's going to be, it's going to be awesome. We got the, I got the 8k switcher in. It's actually, we'll be using it in 4k mode with 40 inputs, 4k, um, the constellation 8k. Yeah. So it's next week is like when it all finally comes together. Now we, we will, fully be able to do for now two completely remote um locations totally different angles we'll probably eventually expand that out to about four but you know it just takes time man but yeah we're almost like i'm i'm to the point now where i'm ready for that i wouldn't have been ready for that like a week ago um but i just have a few more things to do here and i have to reshoot my video uh about starship starship belly flopping <laughs> because i've been editing it and it's to the point where it's more than 50 percent voiceover because I had messed up so many things or like changed so many things or certain <laughs> things happened after 10. And, and so I reshot so much of it. It was getting awkward to the point where you could easily hear the tonal differences and like easily hear mm. all the different things. And I'm like, what? I just have so many new additions and so many little things that I want to add anyway. I'm just going to reshoot it. So I'll be reshooting that like maybe tonight, but for sure tomorrow. So um, that's yeah. what I'm working on. Yep. And then okay. hopefully, you know, driving home, not not yet, but not next week, but maybe in two weeks or whatever. We'll see. We'll, we'll see. Good luck. Yeah. Looking thanks. forward to it. Yeah. And we'll All see right, you guys. guys in our ludicrous, our ludicrous future. Hey, guys. Thanks so much for watching and for listening. We really do appreciate it. We couldn't do it without you. Yeah, and if you want more of us, you can consider becoming a Patreon member where you can get early access to episodes. You can listen to us record live, join our awesome Discord community, or get your name in the show credits. So head over to olfpod.com slash Patreon to learn more. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>